Hey everyone, not too long ago I did a challenge run where I did fist weapons only and went into it without planning it out. Definitely had some funny but painful moments during it, but that got me thinking. How would it go if I did plan everything out? Which in thought just seems boring, basically doing the same thing all over again, but that's when a thought popped into my head. Can you beat Dark Souls with double the enemies with fist weapons only? But that said, let's get into the rules for this run. Rule number one, fist weapons only. That includes bare fist, dragon bone fist, cestus, claws, and dark hands. For this run, I'll strictly be using the cestus since they are objectively the best fist weapons in the game. Rule number two, all rings are allowed, but no shields. We all know by now shields are weapons too. Rule number three, only buff items are spells. This includes all weapon buff spells, self buff spells, and item buffs. Rule number four, double trouble mod. This will be the only mod that will be used for this run to double the enemies. Number five, pants only. Kind of. I tried my best to only use pants for armor to match Goku in the thumbnail. Number six, say states for boss fights. I really tried not to use say states, but at a certain boss, I got fed up with them and started to use it. I know some of you will not be happy about this, but I think you will understand why I did it when I get to that fight. Number seven, level caps. Kind of. I tried my best not to be over level for the boss fights, but at a certain point, I had to throw that idea out the window. Number eight, embers and buffs are locked behind bosses. I can only get large ember, wood grain ring, and power within after bell gargoyles, and very large ember after ornstein and smoke. I do this because I hate myself for some reason. Number nine, no summoner glitches. And finally, number 10, beat every boss in the game. With that said, let's get this run started. I start off by naming my character Goku because I will be dying a lot. For the class, I went with Pyromancer due to the fact that it starts at level one and I'll be able to put a few more points into it than the others. Plus raggedy pants like Goku. For the gift, I of course went with the master key to be able to have an easy access to Blight Town and Darkroot Basin. With all that said, I can start my hellish adventure. I wake up in my cell and immediately break out thanks to Daddy Oscar. You can call me Lemon Baby Girl. So, I decided to give myself a Cestus at the beginning due to the fact it would probably take me over 30 minutes or more to kill the Asylum Demons with bare fists, and I'm not ready for that type of challenge run. With that said, I start making my way... What the fuck? You're not supposed to be here yet. Oh dear god, nope, nope, no, 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 oh fuck. Lovely start to the run. Well, it can't get much worse than this. Fine, Daddy Lemon, I mean Oscar. I sweet talk him with likes and comments, and in return he gives me some freshly squeezed lemonade, and then dies a horrible death. Sorry, Lemon. With lemonade in hand, it's time to take on the Asylum Demon. Start of the fight, I went straight for a plunge attack, hoping to hit both of them, but I guess not. So I would normally just hang out behind the Asylum Demons behind, but with two of them out and about, I really didn't know what to do. So at that moment, I came up with a very complex plan to handle it. Go for the one with the lowest health. Which seemed to be going okay until I started playing like shit, and the copy demon came out of nowhere, hitting me through the original one, putting me down to zero Estus. Unfortunately, it's not just the copies that can do this. All bosses' attacks can go through each other, and it will become a massive pain later on in this run. At this point, I was pretty confident I was going to die, but with sheer luck, I somehow killed the original while magically not getting hit by the copy's attack in that moment. After that, I went straight for that demon ass and went straight to Pound Town, earning myself my first victory. With the Asylum Demons defeated, I made my way to Firelink Shrine. Here, I got some souls and made my way to New Londo Ruins. In New Londo Ruins, you can get a Firekeeper soul in the first section right here. I ran for dear life, grabbed the Firekeeper soul, and made a quick escape. Back at Firelink Shrine, I upgraded my flask to plus one. From here, I made my way to Undead Burr. It shouldn't be that bad getting back. Fuck! Why am I doing this? Why? Why? How many times do I have to die just to get to a fucking bonfire? Why? Ah, finally. Made it to Undead Burr. Wasn't too bad getting here. While here, I hit my first level cap of 10 and just put all my points into strength for as much damage as possible. I then proceed to break into someone's home and steal their gold pine resin. They won't be needing it. The reason I'm getting the gold pine resin is that it will add 160 lightning damage to my weapon, and the next boss that I'll be taking on is extremely weak to lightning. 
With that said, it's time to take on the Taurus Demon. For this fight, I just did the normal strategy of plunge attack and DPS as fast as you can, which funny enough worked. I got lucky and dodged their first attack, which gave me the opening to finish one off. I tried to repeat the strategy again, successfully pulling off the plunge attack, but not so much the DPSing part. After that mess up, I ran straight into the Taurus Demon's furry crotch for protection and comfort. The reason I like to hang out here, besides for the view and warmth, is that it gives me the opportunity to roll between his legs to avoid most of his attacks. While in my safe place, I was able to easily take down the demon, earning me my second victory. Only 24 more to go. Great. With the Taurus demons defeated, I used their bounty to get myself to level 15. Here, I put all 5 points into intelligence. I do this in preparation for when I get magic weapon. From here, I use the master key to access Darkroot Garden simply because it's less of a hassle to get to Undead Parish this way. Once at Undead Parish, I find Andre and acquire my second Cestus. Also, lucky for me, Andre sells Titanite shards for 800 souls, and with every enemy being doubled, it wasn't hard for me to get the souls I needed to buy 9 Titanite shards to upgrade my Cestus to plus 5. With that done, I snagged me another Firekeeper soul and acquired the Basement Key. Now, having the Basement Key, I start making my way to the Lower Undead Burg, just need to cross this bridge, and where did the 20,000 souls come from? Oh, the Red Drakes somehow killed each other? I was going to use this area to grind souls, but I guess this works instead. I make my way across the bridge and access the lower burg. The dogs were a bit of a pain. Well, maybe more than a bit. After successfully punching some dogs to death, I rescued Griggs, found the female merchant, and unlocked a shortcut to her. I then made my way back to Firelink Shrine and bought Magic Weapon and Lingering Dragon Crest Ring from Griggs. Some of you may already know how Magic Weapon works, but I'll give you a quick crash course on it. Simply, Magic Weapon multiplies your Magic Adjustment stat, which is based off of your Catalyst and your Intelligence level by 0.8. It is then added to your current weapon's damage. This will be very useful for taking down the majority of the bosses in this run. With that said, I pick up some Charcoal Pine Resin from the Female Merchant, getting me some nice 80 fire damage to help out with the Bell Gargoyles. After that, I rescue sweet old Lotric and punch him off a cliff, like you do with all sweet old people. I snagged his ring, which will be extremely helpful with the extra health and stamina that it will give. I finally upgrade my flask to plus two, and it's finally time to take on the Bell Gargoyles. The Bell Gargoyles fight went better than I expected, but I honestly think it's just that I got lucky. I started off trying to just use magic weapon and see how it would go. It was going pretty good until the original gargoyle got down to half health and then all hell broke loose. I did not survive long after that. Second round I tried to use the charcoal pine resin to see if it would help and it did not. Third round I found out if you get the copy gargoyle down to half health it does not trigger the other gargoyles. So that's good but he can now shoot fire so that's not so good. I ended up dying shortly after this and completely ran out of charcoal pine resins in the process. Can you guess what I did next? Went straight back in because fuck it, why not? So my strategy for this fight was to just focus on the copy the entire time since getting it to half health does not trigger the others. The only hard part of this is trying to keep track of which gargoyle was which and unfortunately this will be a recurring problem in this run because there is no way to tell the copy apart from the original. But even with that handicap, I was able to take out the copy with a few well-timed heavy attacks. With the copy finished, the original was no problem to deal with, even with him calling for backup, I was able to take him down. After that, it was pretty easy dealing with the reinforcements, just wait for them to breathe fire and punch them to death. Scoring myself my third victory. With that out the way, I take my earnings and buy the Crest of Artorius. I run through Darkroot Gardens to the sealed door, and I'm ready to start farming. Where the hell are the forest hunters? Oh, you gotta be fucking with me. Well, there goes my other farming method. While I'm here, I join the Forest Hunters Covenant, which in doing so summons Shiva and his bodyguard, and I kindly escort them to their graves. The bodyguard drops the wood grain ring. The wood grain ring increases the amount of iframes I get on my rolls and makes them a bit faster. After looting another dead body for a ring, I start hunting some mushroom parents. Mushroom parents have an 80% chance to drop gold pine resin and a 20% chance to drop two of them. I'm doing this in preparation for the next few boss fights. 
After establishing the Mushroom Orphanage of Darkroot Gardens, I try to take on the Moonlight Butterfly. Alrighty, I'll be back later. With my tail between my legs, I make my way to take on the Capra Demon. Funny enough, this fight went really well. I was level 20 for this fight and put all 5 points into strength for extra damage. I did the usual strategy of taking out the dogs and beelining it straight for the archway and somehow pulled it off. From here, I just cheese plunged them to death to earn my fourth victory. With the depths key in hand, I make my way into the depths. Here, I get the very large ember. I then make my way into Blytown to hunt giant leeches. Giant leeches have a 5.15% chance to drop large Tynite shards, and I will need a total of 9 to get my weapon to plus 10. After I finished farming, I made my way back to Andre and upgraded my weapon. Let's see how Moonlight Butterfly is doing. Alrighty then. While in Darkroot Gardens, I start farming Stone Knights to help hit my next level cap. Stone Knights alone gives 600 souls, but with two of them gives me an easy 1200 souls per kill. With that, I hit my next level cap of 30. I put 5 points into Intelligence to increase my Magic Adjustment stat and the rest into Strength for extra physical damage. I then make my way back to Blacktown to get Power Within and another Firekeeper Soul. Should I have gone these earlier? Yes. As you will come to learn, I don't make the best decisions. Back at Firelink Shrine, I upgrade my Flask to plus 3. With that all done, I safely make my way to the Death's Bonfire, but for some reason, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Is anyone there? I can use a little bit of help. Well, someone should come for me eventually, right? Right? Nah, it's probably nothing. From here, it's time to take on the Gaping Dragon. So it had been a minute since I fought the Gaping Dragon, and while being crushed under his feet, I had completely forgotten that the Chandler can shoot you during this fight. So I made sure to take them out so that doesn't keep happening. Even after that, I died a few more times trying to refigure out his attack pattern, but once I figured it out, he wasn't too much trouble to deal with. Really, the easiest way I found to deal with both of them is to just wait for one of them to raise their head, showing their teeth, this indicates that they're about to slam their head into the ground, and when they do this, it gives me enough time to get a few hits in and run away. The only attacks I made sure to look out for were the dragon's charge attack and his tail attack. These were the only two attacks that would get me from time to time. After learning this, I was easily able to slay that dragon's poon poon. After that lovely threesome, I started making my way back to Blacktown to take on Chaos Witch Quail. Okay, this fight was hell for me. I was foolishly still trying to do this fight with a level cap of 35, and I was getting nowheres with it. This was the fight that made me give up on level caps and start using safe states. I honestly just didn't have time to keep running back and forth. I have a limited amount of time doing these runs, and I didn't want this video to take two months to get done. With that said, how many times do you think I died during this fight? I'll give you a second to think about it. If you guessed 25, you would be wrong. It's 88. I died 88 times in this damn fight. Four hours. Four grueling long hours to beat this damn fight. God, I don't even know where to begin. Let's just start off with what y'all already know. Pretty much every one of Quaylax's attacks can hit you through the other one. I could be mid-opportunity getting hits in and BAM! I get hit in the face with lava, a sword poke, or her damn AoE. Honestly, it just felt like I got cheated most of the time due to this. It felt more RNG based than skill based. I knew the fights were not going to be balanced, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Around my 50th death, I finally caved and gave up on level caps. I still wanted to see if I could do it at a reasonable level, so I stopped myself at level 45. Really, this fight is just chaotic. Sometimes I would get lucky and the Quaylogs would just try and chase me and do their sword combo, which is usually the best time to get some hits in, but other times they went buck wild covering the entire area in lava. Where the hell am I supposed to go? It was maddening, to say the least. I got close at one point taking out one of them to then die in a 1v1, which did not feel good and will sadly become a reoccurring theme in this run. My strategy, if you want to call it that, was to just focus on one of them and keep an eye out for the other. Genius. Because that's really all you can do when you can get fucked over at any moment. With that long-winded paragraph done with, I finally defeated them with sheer force and luck, scoring me my fourth victory.
After experiencing what hell is like, I make my way to Sen's fortress and save Logan. I will be needing him for a weapon buff later on in this run. With Logan rescued, I make my way atop of the tower to take on the Iron Gold. The Iron Golem fight went way better than the Quake Light fight. I only died 7 times and I was level 60 when I beat them. It was still rough, but that was mostly due to the fact that the Copy Golem cannot be toppled like the original. Also, the Golem's air slash attack was pretty annoying. Due to how large the Golem is, it puts enough distance between you and the other one for him to just spam it non-stop. Besides that, it wasn't too bad to figure out how to take them down. Once learning the copy demon cannot be toppled, I focus on the original and just cheats them off the map. With the original down, it was time for the 1v1. Due to the copy being stun proof, I actually had to fight him in a fair manner, which means running between his legs and attacking him from behind. After a few hits to his Achilles heels, he goes down, earning me my 7th victory. With the Iron Golem down, time to take on Moonlight Butterfly. Some of you may be thinking me being level 70 for this fight is over level, and I'm okay with that. Because it was pure hell before. When trying to fight them both, you could dodge one of their attacks perfectly, but right at the end of your roll, you immediately get hit by the other one with no possible way of dodging it, and it gets a hundred times worse when they are not on the same side. I would prefer to not be taking it from both sides, if you know what I mean. But jokes aside, this was the whole RNG thing I was talking about earlier. You really can just get screwed even when you're playing well. So that's why I decided to just be a high level for this fight so I could just DPS one of them down as fast as possible. Plus, I hate how long it takes for this boss to actually come down for you to be able to hit them. I don't know if it was the mod, but it felt like it took longer than usual for the Moonlight Butterfly to come down. But bitching aside, I earned my 8th victory. After facing my fears, I made my way into the catacombs to take on Naruto Uzumaki. Oh no, there's two pinwheels. Whatever shall I do? Somebody help me. Oh, he's dead. Well, that was easy. With the seventh Hokage dead, I head to the Undead Asylum and grab the peculiar doll. I'll be needing it to access the painted world. After acquiring the doll, I finally made it to Anor Lotno. From here, I made sure to knock down an expensive chandelier that for some reason has a magical scroll on it. I'm actually very curious as to how it got there, but oh well. I make my way down and snag it. Greater magic weapon will multiply my magic adjustment stat by 1.2. Simply, more damage. With my new buff, I make my way into the castle. Silly silver knights, ledges are for pledges. Speaking of pledges, <laughs> I started a Patreon and channel membership. If you would like to support the channel, check the link down below or click that join button. And in return for your support, your name will be in the video. I'm still very new to this, so if you have any suggestions of perks for being a supporter, let me know. With that said, let's get back to the run. Alright, let's try Ornstein and Smo. Hmm, I see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna go here, take this, move them right over here, take Priscilla, put her right here, and perfect. All right, good to go. With those changes made, I make my way into the painted world of Arianus. Beat up an undead dragon, punch a slower half in the crotch to access a shortcut, and with that, time to take on Crossbreed Persona. I haven't fought Priscilla since I was forced to kill her for an achievement, so I was expecting her to be a bit harder of a fight, especially with there being two of them, but it was probably the easiest fight so far besides Pinwheel and that saying something. All I had to do was follow her footprints on the ground and it was pretty much a checkmate. The Priscilla's got a few hits on me, but I was able to recover quickly so I didn't worry about it so much. But with tears in my eyes, I killed the two Priscilla's, tragically giving me my 10th victory. With Priscilla sadly dead, I threw myself off a ledge for the crime I committed and unfortunately ended up in Anor Londo. Not the outcome any of us wanted. From here, I head to New Londo Ruins to get the very large ember to get my fist up to plus 15. While in this area, I pay Quelag's little sister a visit. 
I'm sorry, but it had to be done. Unfortunately though, you can only have one Firekeeper soul on you at a time, so I was only able to take one with me and wasn't in the mood to backtrack for the other one. I will end up regretting this decision later on. I then make my way back to Anor Londo to start grinding Royal Sentinels. Royal Sentinels have an 8% chance to drop Titanite Chunks, and I'll be needing a total of 9 to get my weapon to plus 14. I could have farmed Dark Braids instead, but it didn't go so well when I tried, so I decided to stick with the Royal Sentinels instead. After getting all 9 Titanite Chunks, I made my way back to the Great Hollow to farm Crystal Lizards. Quick side note, I forgot to mention earlier that I got the Covetous Gold Serpent Ring at Sin's Fortress to help out with grinding. Back to the Lizards. The Crystal Lizards in the Great Hollow have a 10% chance of dropping a Titanite Slab. You would think with everything being doubled, the Crystal Lizards would double my chances, but you would be sadly wrong. The Copy Lizards do not drop anything for some reason, but I ended up getting lucky on my second batch to get a Titanite Slab. With all upgrade materials in hand, I max out my weapon, and with that, it's finally time to take on Ornstein and Smoke. Ornstein and Smo, and Ornstein and Smo was fucking hell. I thought Quelag was bad, but she doesn't come anywhere as close to this fight. Some of you may have watched my first weapons only video before, and may recall me talking about how janky Ornstein's stash attack is. Well, it becomes way worse when there are two of them just spamming about. Literally, the AI just loses its shit. With there being two more objects that the pathing has to deal with, it just makes Ornstein go all over the place. It happens almost every time at the start of the fight if you make your character go to the right, which I use to my advantage later on. I first tried this fight at level 75 just to see how it would go, and I quickly realized this is not going to work. So after about every 25th death, I would allow myself 5 levels. So generous of myself. I eventually stop at level 100 because at this point my heavy attack was doing 415 damage at full power. And it would only take 4 hits to kill a single Ornstein. I just wanted to reiterate this. This was with full buffs at level 100. Just to give you a comparison, when Little Aggie did the Double Trouble mod, he was at level 55 doing 429 damage with a plus 4 Crystal Halberd with no buffs and just a heavy attack. 429 with no buffs, just pointing it out there. Even with doing this much damage, if you think you have time to breathe, think again. Even when you're behind a pillar, there's still a good chance one of the four bosses will get you, and sometimes it'll be the game's fault if you get hit or even mess up an action. What you're seeing right now isn't me having a brain fart like when you walk into a room and completely forget why you went in there. No. This was the game not reading my input to buff myself. I was literally spamming the L1 button at this time, but it took multiple presses until it finally worked. I ran into this issue multiple times. I don't know if it's the game itself, the mod, or my controller, but it was infuriating when it happened. Speaking of things that are infuriating, isn't it maddening when you finally make it to the second phase of a boss fight to die and then for it to take hours for you to get back to the point to just die again and again and again and again and again and again and a fucking again? <sighs> to be honest, a part of me wanted to quit at this point, but I'm an idiot like Goku, so I kept on trying. After dying 133 times, I finally pulled it off. I was able to swiftly kill the first Ornstein and somehow killed the second one without having to heal. I then proceed to use 7 of my Estus to kill a single Smo, leaving me with only one, make that zero Estus to finish off the last Smo. The reason I ended up healing at this moment is because if I didn't, Smo could one-shot me. But lucky for me, I don't need any more healing. Soon after, an opening appeared for me to attack, and an attack I did. I attacked so hard, Smo called me daddy afterwards. Don't know why I just said that, but fuck it, I don't care. I just earned my 11th victory. After experiencing the 5th level of hell, time for my reward. Double titties. Where the titties? There's only one pair of titties. Where the hell is the second Guinevere? You're telling me I went through all of that just to get a single rack. This is some bullshit. Someone has to pay. Nope. Still mad. Well, after that disappointment, I place the Lord Vessel, return to Orlando, run through the Duke archives, and get killed by Seath. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Damn it, Miyazaki. After being cursed by Miyazaki himself, I break out of prison, I get the key to free Logan, and then I try to figure out how to do all these tentacle mummies. I mean kill all these tentacle mummies. After that tentacle orgy and traumatizing Logan, I free him and get the Firekeeper soul in the back of his cell. From here I find Logan again and buy all of his spells to continue his quest. I'm doing this for an item that you can get from him at the end of it. 
All right, at this point, I'm tired of being cursed, so I visit Oswell to buy some purging stones to fix it. Before taking on Seath, I head back to Darkroot Gardens to make sure the Mushroom Orphanage stays an orphanage. With that done, it's time to take on Seath the Scales. Seath was surprisingly easy. I only died to him once, and that was because the two Seaths both decided to throw a tipper tantrum at the same time. I learned from my mistake the first round of going behind him, so this time I just stayed on his front and was able to take him out. I also found out that Greater Magic Weapon did more damage than the Gold Pine Resin. You might be saying, a cane, didn't you buy Crystal Magic Weapon? Yes. Yes, I did. Moving on. With that, I earned my 12th victory. After defeating Seath, I made my way to his chambers to find a mentally scarred Logan. Logan couldn't stop thinking about the tentacle orgy, so I had to put him out of his misery. And for my good deed, I was given the 10 Crystallization Catalyst. The reason I chose to use the TCC is simply due to having the highest magic adjustment stat in the game. But it does come at a cost. It reduces the amount of spells I have by half, which leaves me with only one use of Crystal Magic Weapon. I am okay with this because my plan is to simply kill one of the bosses as fast as possible and just fight the other one normally. Definitely won't be a problem later on, but with that aside, it's time to take on Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn was a pain in the ass. The damn AI kept spamming Key Blast and Kamehameha non-stop. Worst part would be when I would get to them, I would be a hit or two away from killing them and they would just teleport away. For me to then die having to do it all over again. This fight was pure RNG. Really, you want him to spam his bow attack since it's the easiest to dodge, but the hardest to see, and for some reason, he never wanted to do it. But finally, after dying 21 times, I finally got lucky and killed him in one combo, earning me my 13th victory. After dealing with Mr. Daddy issues himself, I make my way to Undead Asylum to take on the Stray Deep. It took me five tries to kill the stray demons. To say I had a strategy for them would be saying I knew what I wanted to major in for college, aka winging it. I just tried to DPS one down as fast as I could while trying to survive dash dodge the onslaught of AoEs, but with sheer luck I managed to earn my 14th victory. From here I head to Quelag's domain where I'm reminded of how much of a monster I am. Speaking of ugly bastards, Hello, Seathless Discharge. His fight was pretty straightforward. I steal his sister's clothes. They get mad and try to discharge on me without my consent. You should always ask before you discharge all over someone. It's just the polite thing to do. After they finish, they take a long nap. Typical men, no cuddling afterwards. How rude. With Seathless put to bed, time to take on the Fire Sage. Some of you might be thinking this played out the exact same way as the Stray Demon since they are the same boss. You would be horribly, horribly wrong. I died 43 times. I already disliked this boss and now I hate it. This fight is just a pain in the ass. Of course it has the same bullshit as the Stray Demon with the spamming AoEs, but the arena itself causes a lot of issues. The arena just has so many damn roots and limbs. I understand the aesthetic, but when they cause you to get stuck or worse, obscure your vision, it's just fucking annoying. Speaking of things that are annoying, his damn hitbox of his butt slam attack. It completely lingers. I'm not joking, look. He had already finished slamming down when I rolled into him and I still took damage. Why, FromSoft, why? Now I could go on a long rant about bosses and their hitboxes, but I'll save that for another video. So how did I beat these bastards? Very simple, wait for the right opener. You just need both of them to slam down their catalyst. If they do anything else, you're pretty much fucked. This was the only attack pattern that I found that I could actually dodge. If you get lucky for this to happen, you just need to try to DPS the copy demon as fast as possible. From here, I try and line up the copy demon with the original so that the copy demon can stop most of his attacks. But again, RNG is involved, so you will get fucked from time to time. Just keep the pressure and the copy demon will go down. Now don't go getting cocky like me because you can get the boss to be one hit away and then die and then for it to take another hour for you to beat the damn thing. Just give me the damn reward. From one hell spawn to the next, time to take on the centipede demon.
The centipede demon wasn't horrible, but still a bit annoying. Only died 16 times, so not too bad. Oh, did y'all know if you attack his arm, it cuts it off and comes alive chasing you? Because I did it. I also found out if you kill it, it drops the orange charred ring. I honestly thought you had to kill the boss itself to get this. Not his arm. Still learning new things to this day. I have over 200 hours into this game. Fucking crazy. This worked out in my favor because I used the charred ring to beat these ugly bastards. Being able to run on the lava gave me the chance to actually dodge their attacks instead of being pinned up against the wall. With my new lava shoes, it wasn't really hard to beat them, earning myself my 16th victory. With the centipede demon dead, I can rest at the... wait... Isn't there supposed to be a bonfire here? Oh well. Shouldn't be that hard to get to the next bonfire. Mother fucker. Finally. Made it to the bed of chaos. Oh, there's the bonfire. I see what the modder did now. I 100% agree with this new placement. Damn it, Quaylag's other sister that no one cares about. Leave me alone. I'm just trying to rest at the damn bonfire. Fine. Equality. <sighs> After spreading equality, time to take on the Bed of Chaos. So with the bonfire right outside the boss door, I can just die right after breaking the first barrier and then just go for the second one. Sounds like a good plan to me. Let's put it into action. Alrighty, one barrier down, and then I go down, respawn, start making my way for the second one, and wait a minute. Why is the first barrier still up? No, 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 no. I'm going to have to do this in one go, don't I? Oh, fuck me. You know what? I'm not even that mad. Your mother's a whore! Finally, I got both. It wasn't too bad. I just need to not fuck up now. Uh, I might cry. <sighs> Once more into the fray. Oh? Oh? Ooh, thank God I don't have to cry now. I'm just going to jump over here and punch the shit out of this demonic fetus for me to earn my 17th victory. Thank you, God. With the bed of chaos no more, I make my way to the Tomb of Giants. Here, I farm bone towers. Bone towers have a 5% chance to drop white tinite chunks. Why do I need white tinite chunks, you say? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll be needing them to upgrade my left Cestus to a plus 10 divine weapon. The reason for this is when I fight Nito, I can actually kill his skeletons. Without a divine weapon, they will keep coming back to life, and with there being double them out, I'll want them all dead to actually fight Nito. But I need two more things. I need the large divine ember, which is found in a giant's tomb, and lastly, a white tinite slab, which is next to Nito's boss door. With all these ingredients, I can finally make myself a plus 10 divine weapon. With all preparations done, I can take on Gravelord Nito. Nito was a bit of a pain. Well, not Nito himself, it was his damn skeletons. They killed me every time, 16 times to be exact. I had a feeling the skeletons were going to be a pain to deal with, but not to this extent. Nothing I tried was working, I didn't have enough poise to not get stunned, nor was I able to kill them fast enough, so I needed to change something. So I headed over to Darkroot Garden and picked up the Wolf Ring. The Wolf Ring adds 40 points to your poise. It seemed to work, but I was still dying. I decided to stick with it for a few more times, and look at that. I was finally able to kill Nito's army of skeletons. After that, I chained Cestus as fast as possible, buffed myself, and started pimp slapping like no pimp has ever dreamed of. It was such a beautiful pimp slap, it even brought Griggs to tears. Through this new ultra pimp slap technique, I was able to make Gravelord Nito my bitch, earning me myself my 19th victory. With Nito and his goons finished, I made my way to Darkroot Basin. Here I kill some Hydras, rescue Dusk, and head back to the Duke Archives and kill a crystal dude for a pendant. Then proceed to get a man handled by a giant hand with eyeballs. I end up at Sanctuary Garden, and y'all know what that means. Time to take on the Sanctuary Guardian. This fight was utter hell, but extremely fun at the same time. Let me explain. The part that was annoying was the fact that the Guardian's lightning projectiles can go through each other, so you think you're fine smacking away at him when all of a sudden you get hit by a giant ball of lightning, which ends up causing you to get killed. Really, if it wasn't for the projectiles going through the bosses, it was actually a fun fight. Dodging and using the other boss to block the other one's attack was really fun. 
What I mean by blocking attacks, I mean physical attacks. None of the physical attacks that I'm aware of were able to go through each other, but if one could, it would be the Guardian's Tail Whip attack. Just because it's a big sweeping attack, but it never happened to me, so this is just speculation. Even though I really enjoyed some of the parts of this fight, it did force me to break my level 100 rule. I just couldn't damage him enough to feel like I could actually win, so I ended up caving and raised my level to 120. Even from here, it still took me a while to win. I died a total of 78 times during this fight. The way I went about it was just focusing on one of them until they died. No shit. But I wish there was a bit more to it than that, but the mod is not balanced for them to be an actual duo fight. It was close, even with one only left. I only had two Estes left, and unfortunately had to use both of them. We were neck and neck, both inching closer to death. He didn't want to die, and I didn't want to have to retry this fight again for another two hours. I don't know if it was luck, skill, or my guardian angel Oscar, but I somehow pulled it off and it was the biggest dopamine rush of my life. With great joy, I earned my 20th victory. With the guardian defeated, it's time for the boss fight everyone has been waiting for. Artorius the Abyss Wonder. I thought Ornstein and Smo was bad, like really, really bad, and didn't think anything was going to come close to that, and I was horribly, horribly wrong. Duo Artorius makes Ornstein and Smo look like child's play. So you know how if you get knocked down by Artorius, he can juggle you essentially for a few hits? Well, if one of the Artoriuses knocks you down, the other one can just start juggling you, or worse, one of them juggles you and finishes for the other one to just pick up for where the other one left off to keep juggling you. It's horrible. This sound right here haunts me at night. All I hear is the constant smashing of my character over and over and over and over again. It's pure hell. What also sucks about this fight is trying to heal, since anytime you feel like you have a chance to heal, you'll get punished for it. So most of the time, I didn't even try to heal during the fight because it just didn't feel worth it. The only pattern that I found that I felt like I had a chance was getting them both down to the point they go into their powered up state. When they are in this state, they will periodically back up to charge an AoE attack, which then allowed me to have a 1v1 with the other one. Sadly, I was only able to get one of them close to death twice out of the 145 tries, and it ended up mentally breaking me. I went from confident to pure rage to feeling nothing. I tried every possible strategy, but nothing worked. I just kept dying and dying and dying again. This is my life now, and I just need to accept it. Nope, I'm fucking done. It's been seven hours. Seven fucking hours nonstop of dying. I'm done, Notorious. I am done. I do not feel proud of this at all. I really wanted to beat this fight with what I had, but I couldn't do it anymore. I'm sorry to all of you, and more importantly to myself for giving up. But what's done is done. I must move forward with the little bit of sanity that I have left. With that, I sadly earned my 21st victory. After the Artorias fight, I ran into Kieran. She asked for Artorias' soul, and I gave it to her, because I definitely don't deserve it. From here, I found a key in a Mimic's mouth, which led me to a friendly giant who kindly handicapped a little birdie for me to fight. And that little birdie is none other than Black Dragon Calamite. Calamite was rough, but in a fun way, if you know what I mean. Starting off, I thought the fight was a bit bullshit with them spamming their fire breath attack, but eventually I was able to figure them out and not really get hit by any of them by the end of it. One of the things that did piss me off though was his damn dive bomb attack. And not because of the attack itself, when the two Calamites are next to each other and one of them decides to do this attack, if the attacker is coming from behind, it will push the attacker into a direction instead of just stopping them, and when you die this way, you just feel like you have been cheated. This isn't the biggest issue with this fight, the real issue was the amount of damage I was doing at full power. So come to find out for the DLC bosses, they drastically increased their resistances so you couldn't cheese them. I understand this, but when fighting two of them at the same time, it's basically a death sentence. So I ended up saying fuck the rules, and I started giving myself levels so I could feel like I was actually doing some decent damage. It was still a hard fight, even with the extra levels. I did find out though, if you just hang out between his legs, you can get a lot of hits in, and you can dodge all of his attacks while avoiding the other one. 
I also ended up having another catalyst on me to reapply crystal magic weapon. I did this to help increase the amount of damage that I could do throughout the entire fight, and in doing so, this led me to actually defeating one of the dragons. So, after dying 17 times, I was finally able to slay the black dragon, Calamite. With Calamite defeated, I find a silver pendant and rescue puppy Sif. With puppy Sif safe and sound, time to take on Manus, father of the abyss. I'm just going to get this out of the way. I ended up maxing my character out for this fight because I was tired at this point and really just wanted to get it over with. Sadly, this did not help. I still ended up dying 82 times. Manus is like Artorius. He's fast and he can juggle you non-stop and lore does he like to juggle you. I did find out you just need to stay on his left side to deal with him. It's kind of funny in this way to see that Manus is pretty much the same as the Bloodstar Beast and Bloodborne. Overall though, he's not as hard as Artorius due to the fact that you can actually heal in this fight and the Manuses don't attack you non-stop. The way I was able to beat these bastards was with a good opening, a new fist combo, and most importantly, humanity. For the opening, I found going around left and going for the Manus to the farthest to the right gave me the best setup to get multiple hits in. This does not always work. If one of the Manuses decides to throw a fit and juggle you, you're pretty much fucked. With that aside, the new combo is using light attack into a heavy attack and repeating this. This combo is weirdly faster than just spamming R1 or R2, and with this, I was able to deal massive damage at a faster rate. Unfortunately, even with these two things, it was not enough to take them down. I came very close at one point, and if I had just a single Estus left, I'm pretty positive I could have won. Which then led to me finally realizing that I have a massive humanity farm next to me, and I was not using it. So I ended up farming up some humanity, went back in, and I was finally able to beat McAnus, as my girlfriend likes to call him, earning me my 23rd victory. After the Manus fight, I was level 709. I did not want to take on the last three bosses at this level, so I dropped myself down to level 100. With that said, time to take on Great Great Wolf. Well, alrighty then. As usual, Sif's fight was pretty easy. Even with there being two of her, I had no issues taking one down. Come to find out, you only have to beat one of them. So I'll take it. Y'all can be mad all y'all want. The poster says dead or alive. With one Sif defeated and the other one spared, time to take on the Ford King. The four kings was the same as usual, just DPS them as fast as you can. For this fight, I decided to bring an extra catalyst to reapply crystal magic weapon due to how long this fight normally goes. It was a bit tricky at times having to deal with so many of them. I even ended up having to use all of my Estus to take out the copy king. But once he was defeated, I was very confident in my victory. From here, I just stay as close as I can to the four kings and smack away to earn my 25th victory. With the eight kings defeated, I can finally access the kiln of the first flame to finally end this run once and for all, thank god. And with that said, time to take on Gwyn, the Lord of Cinder. I have a lot to talk about for this fight. Let's just get to the amount of deaths and time it took out of the way. It took me about two hours to beat in 69 deaths. Very appropriate. The really sad part was around the first hour of trying, I was about to win. Gwen was only one parry away from dying, so at this moment I tried to do the cheese tactic where you drink your Estus to make Gwen's AI do an attack that is parryable. I have never done this before and panicked, parrying too early causing me to get hit. Which then caused me to panic even more and I tried to run away to heal but end up getting killed in the process. I haven't gotten this mad since my first time trying to beat the Lotric Brothers in Dark Souls 3. After this defeat, I fell into a massive slump of not really trying and basically giving up. It wasn't until I discovered two things by accident that led me to a strategy to beat them. So before this, I was trying to parry everything non-stop, but with no success, and couldn't figure out why. It was essentially due to my character not being close enough to Gwyn to actually parry his attacks. I had no clue that I had to be riding his dick to actually parry him, and I found this out by pure accident. In one of my half ass attempts, I just kept running straight in, pressing L1, to parry in hopes it would work. And to my surprise, it did. I was shocked by this, so I tried it again to make sure it actually worked and it wasn't a fluke, and sure enough it wasn't. 
So from here, I knew if I needed to parry his attacks, I needed to get as close to him as possible. Now the only other issue was healing. Anytime you want to heal in this fight, the Gwens pretty much don't let you. So I was using the Hornet Ring at the time to help with doing more parry damage, but upon reloading, I forgot to put it back on, which then left me with the Wood Grain Ring equipped. I didn't realize my mistake until after my first parry, but found out I could get away from the Gwens fast enough to actually get a heal in without getting punished for it. So with these two new bits of information, I formed my new strategy to deal with the double Gwens. The strategy was very simple. Get as close to Gwen as possible to parry his attack and immediately run away. I ended up calling this new strategy the hit it and quit it. Shortly after applying this new strategy, I was finally able to beat double Gwen. And with that, I earned my final victory. There was a moment in the middle of combat when you actually said you gave up. Surrender is an outcome far worse than defeat. I won't tolerate that kind of weak behavior from a Saiyan. Come on, Kakarot! Find a way! I entrusted everything to you! My pride, my promise, everything! I won't tolerate failure! Trespass into the domain of the gods! Do it, Kakarot! <laughs> It's stupid. <laughs> Man, what a ride. I went into this knowing it was going to be rough, but my god, I did not know it was going to get this bad. <laughs> Weirdly, I had a good time with it, but I would not recommend anyone else try this. It was definitely mentally draining at some points, but overall, I'm still proud of myself for not calling it quits. I was originally not going to retry Atorius, but it was bothering me way too much that I beat 25 out of the 26 bosses with just pants that I had to go back and try again, and I'm very glad I did. If I didn't, I'm positive I would have regretted it in the future. I hope all of you enjoyed the video. As usual, I appreciate everyone who watches my videos, whether you finished it or not. With that said, until next time, take care. Oh.